Welcome everybody. I'm feeling really humbled that so many of you are here. What I thought was missing from our one in Auckland last year was somebody who wasn't technically inside our community. Three things that I think you should know about Elizabeth is that she's the co-founder of Hummingly. She worked at the Red Cross for 10, over 10 years. That she actually lives only maybe 500 metres up the road from me <laughs> in Island Bay. Which, and we finally managed to align our diets to have a coffee the other week. And I said, would you mind coming along and sharing your games with our people? And she was like, sure. And so I've invited Elizabeth to take us through her work and some of her games, because I think they're phenomenal. So. It's such an honour to be welcomed into your community. And that interviewer said to her, so Kate, are you a martyr or a professional? She was like, what? It's a bit of an odd interview question. And the manager said, let me explain. If you're a martyr, you will be filled with noble purpose. You will work huge hours. You will give it everything you've got. But I won't invest in your professional development because you won't be able to sustain it. So you'll be a good time, but not a long time. That's okay, but I just need to know that. Or are you a professional who is prepared to learn or is open to tools around well-being, resilience, and performance? Yeah. Who is going to be a role model for how to lead in a sustainable way? And who I can count on to support communities through this disaster recovery process for the long haul? She said, either or, I just need to know what you're going to be in this role. And then I thought about myself, because damn, I'm a recovering martyr. I can be quite honest with the, about that. And so that was my other question that was really anchoring to me last year. Am I a martyr or am I a professional? There's three things that I think that people should know, or maybe already know about Sarah. And the first one is that in 2020, she was appointed as a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to women's sport and tertiary education. Thank you for that introduction and thanks for the opportunity to share my, my little corner all tonight with you. I've used the Emotional Culture Deck set for about three, three and a half years and in many different contexts. So I used it with some of my, with my students and my leader, in the leadership class I've used it creating a resilience workshop for students, particularly during COVID last year. It was great having the online option there. And I've actually shared that workshop with students in, in the States as well, because you can kind of do everything on Zoom now. So it's, uh, it's excellent. You don't actually need the cards there. And I've used it, I've done a session with MSD. I've done, who else I work sessions with? Oh, coach developers. But mainly, uh, J Jeremy's asked me to talk about what I do in sport. So I've used this, uh, the Emotional Culture Deck, with a number of uh, national sports organisations, mainly with their management teams or actually with their head office staff. Because again, my belief is, is if you start with the top and you understand there why it's important to know how you feel, then that will filter down through the organisation. Because what often happens is we start with the team that is here and then we expect everything to filter up, but actually that doesn't happen. So if we can start at the top, then we get the impact going through, hopefully. So it's, it's worked really well, and generally they love it because it's tactile, it's something to do, and I've actually been really surprised at how engaged different people have been in this space. One of the things I do is I link the emotional culture deck work with DISC. Any of you familiar with DISC? So, so the DISC profiles that they generate when you do it online are all targeted towards sport. So the language is sport, which is really helpful, and they have a card game of it also in case organisations can't pay for it. So use that as well. So what I generally do is we have them do the full DISC um, assessment beforehand so that we can learn about each other and our preferred behaviours, and then I run into the emotion and the feelings afterwards. When you connect preferred behaviours with feelings, they go, oh, I get it, like there's some comments like, huh, the person actually, it's not that they don't like me, it's just the way that they communicate and they are, it's like, oh yeah, and that don't. And then the final thing I'll say is, um, the session I did with the coach developers was really interesting, so coach developers, their role is to go out and help develop other coaches, and they were going, oh yeah, this would be really good because, you know, often you, you're dealing with different players 
and knowing how they as the coach need to feel to feel successful, but also then how their players and their management team need to feel is really, really important. So I have used it with a number of coaching programs. So there's a couple of sports, um, New Zealand rowing and New Zealand basketball that have created dedicated women's coaching programs. And I've worked with both of those groups and used uh, this, this process and they love it as well. It's a really good, really good thing to do. So yeah, that's kind of me in a, in a quick snapshot. Kapo? One of the three things you should know about tomorrow is that on February the 9th in 2018, tomorrow was the second person in the whole entire planet to buy the game. The first person in New Zealand, but the second in the world who bought the game. I put up the website and the website didn't even have photos of the game. It had like very bad InDesign um, like renderings of the game because we had no money. and. We didn't have enough money to hire a photographer and it just had the, the PDFs of it. And two people bought the game, one in Australia and Sydney and Tamara and, Wel and Wellington. I was like, holy moly, this is mad. Wow, who is this person? And I hand delivered the game to the workplace you were working at at the time. And I'd always thought that it would be really cool to stay in contact with, the, with essentially the first person in New Zealand who bought the game. I was like, how cool would it be to become friends? I don't know if you knew that at the time, but I was like, how cool would it be to become friends with the person who bought the game first? I was like, I want to learn from this person. Uh, and so we went for a coffee and then that was three odd years ago and we've remained close since. And the second thing that you should know about tomorrow is that we're designing a new game together called the Wellbeing Deck. And we've been working on this for a couple of years now and we're going to launch it, fingers crossed, all going to plan in September. The third thing though is that she's now the Head of People Experience at Sharesies. Yeah, I'm Tamara, I'm the Head of People Experience at Sharesies and I found myself in this space at Sharesies where I was able to have quite a lot of influence um, around the culture of the team and the way in which we would grow. Interestingly, for many people around Aotearoa, COVID was a really hard time and, and for us it wasn't and it was a real hard uh, kind of feeling for a lot of us to manage when we were in this company that was really thriving because of COVID. People invested more than ever over COVID, but people were losing their jobs at the same time. It was a really challenging time for us to kind of notice that actually this company is really going to take off during this period. Um, slightly uncomfortable for those of us who have family members um, losing jobs and things, but at that point, more than ever, it was so important for us to connect. There was an amazing response to the, the feeling in the following week. And the feeling I have looking back on that was I was the most connected to my colleagues I've ever felt um, remotely. It was incredible. And so we really took, made the most of that. Earlier this year, our first opportunity came to get a whole 110 in the company at this stage together. Now it was chaos. I will say it was the most chaotic um, facilitation I've ever done, although I have been told that it was apparently very, very well organised, but from my perspective it was chaos. I had this small room with 110 people sitting on the floor, there wasn't even tables or nothing, crammed in, <laughs> doing these like exercises. Um, but you suddenly would see people click, aha, these be words belong to me, I've come up with, them t with, with my colleagues, and um, connection and all these moments where um, it suddenly made sense. And so we've learned heaps of lessons over that time, right? So now we've got these words back in place. We're, we're not asking about how an individual feels, but we are asking them to notice and observe um, feelings and behaviours in the organisation because it's harder to, um, or less helpful actually, to track individual feelings, um, easier to talk about behaviours and things that people are noticing. The metrics are getting better. We're still not quite inducting people that well into it, but we're getting there. And I think... Um, through all of that, you know, the biggest learning I had is that um, you've really got to think about how these things like scale and the purpose, those two things really, really tie together. If you miss out on the purpose and you don't go back to the why you're doing these things, they just become cultural tick box exercises. And this tool is so powerful when you're able to connect back to um, exactly uh, what you're trying to achieve here. I always just come back to like, this is just such an amazing tool for any organisation and if you've got your senior leaders hooked into the why and hooked into it, the things you can do with it are incredible. Um, really, really powerful. And that's really what I've got to share. Cool, thank you.
three things that I think people should know about Eva is that uh, she's a Swiss army knife of skills and experiences, self-proclaimed Swiss army knife of skills and experiences with uh, general management, product management, strategic transformation, community building, and the second thing you should now know is that she's the innovation manager at KPMG, which would make sense that you would have a Swiss army knife in your toolkit <laughs> if you're going to be in innovation. And the third thing you should know is that she's the first leader that I'm aware of in the world who's used the game at, I'm going to call scale, for change leadership conversations. So yes, I am at KPMG. Uh, so I dived, dove really heavily into psychological safety. Um, and if you think about those sort of axes around accountability and trust, um, accountants and professional services have huge accountability. You know, every six minutes is tracked, right? Every visibility on everything they do is, is huge. Some of the lower, more junior levels of our team, the trust isn't always there. So that quadrant is like the anxiety zone, right? And I think if you've got, if you can push that trust up, you can get into this awesome learning space, right? So I kind of wanted to like, how do I get our team up there? And that's really cool. That's where we want to be. I think the other thing around like high performing teams and you can sort of see that those that are making the most mistakes are actually the most high performing because they're learning, they're talking about it, they're moving forward. Those that are communicating really well, like those are the sorts of things that I was super like fascinated in. Um, and that sort of sent me on this, this mission, sent Jeremy a message, I think it was about, yeah, early last year, sort of said, we're on this journey, we need to improve our culture. We've got this conference coming up with 60 of our sort of managers and above for our division from across the country. So we've got seven offices, offices about 250 people. All the leaders are coming together. We really want to do something with this. First challenge, we've only got two hours. <laughs> Um, and we've got a whole bunch of other stuff we need to talk about as well and like, can we do it? And I think we had about two weeks, it was a pretty short turnaround. So Jeremy, the super trooper he was, jumped on the call, um, had spoke to us sort of about what ways we could do this um, and we decided that we were going to just kick on and give it a crack. So that was sort of what we did. Um, whenever we did a question, I sort of, I shared, the national managing partner shared and then one of the other partners sort of said something and they were up for it. So they were vulnerable, they were open. We had some sort of huge heavy stuff being shared immediately, which was really awesome. So it kind of gave that permission, which I think was cool. The crux of the session was two main questions. So one was, um, how have we felt as a team kind of over the last year? So they were able to pick from the desired and undesirable top five as a team and they sort of shared back. We just did that for the first bit. We sort of discussed it. There was some similarity across all the offices of those cards. Some real differences as well. The, the offices that I've actually found were most innovative. Um, obviously, their the culture showed it. You know, like the culture cards, they were happier. They were really open. Um, and those that have had a bit more struggle, a bit more structure, that culture was a bit different. We sort of spoke to that. We didn't do the canvas, obviously with the time we had, but we did ask, how do you know? Like, how do you know that that's what it felt like? So starting to kind of dive a bit deeper. We then shifted into future state and we sort of said, conferences, we're wanting to move forward. We want to, you know, create this ideal team environment. And so what do we want our team to feel like? And like, what do we want that culture to do? So then they did the same exercise, um, five cards. What do we want this to do? Again, we shared, um, again, there were some similarities. There were some cool um, cards like Uncomfortable that were desired, which I loved from an innovation perspective. So that was really, really cool. Um, so feedback on the day, essentially, super easy to use. It felt really cool. They, like, they loved the simplicity of it. Made a difficult conversation easier. Um, a lot of people were like, oh, that's, that's why that person goes to the bathroom just to kind of escape. Like maybe she's feeling overwhelmed. Like it was really helped them identify ways that they could help. Um, our leaders are great, they want to improve, they want to help our team, and this really like enabled them to sort of be more successful at it. The only other thing I wanted to say was, I was listening to a podcast and there was a poet called David White, but the quote that like just rang out and I was like, this is perfect, I have to remember to say it, um, was the language we have in this corporate world is not wide enough for the territory we have already entered. How cool is that? Yeah. So that was like, oh yeah, that's why this is helpful. So um, I think some great conversations before about how human the world is and like these cards just make us more human. So that's my story, thank you. The next person we've got is uh, 
quite dear to my heart actually because I think he was the second ever pro elephant rider. He continues to be a massive inspiration to me and the ECD community because the work he's doing has been real trail, trailblazing in this. He was the first guy to give me the confidence that this game could be used in a corporate of any significant size. It starts with uh, when I was at Air New Zealand and I was an agile coach over maybe a month after we had the meetup and I said, well, why don't we, why don't we try this thing? I have these cards and I haven't tried it before. They want to give it a go. And she said, yeah, okay, let's give it a go. So with the cards, it was like total awesomeness. Um, and I remember to this day that the quote that, and I love repeating it, I'm, I'm sure Jeremy, you heard it, me saying like 10 times to you. One of the, um, these ladies uh, after the, the press exercise, she said that she could feel butterflies in her stomach, like by being so warm and so good with people around her. And she just started hugging everyone because she needed to share it with them. Uh, but I, as I said, this is going to be a story of a confused leader. Um, because after the workshop, the, the, I, I kept talking to the leader and at some stage she said, well, you know, we created this, uh, we came up with these emotions that the team wanted to feel, but I want them to feel something else. And it was amazing, the whole experience, because uh, some of the questions she was asking, for example, Jakub, tell me what's the difference between open and open-minded? I said, well, I'm not a native speaker, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> and well, it, it, it prompt, prompted her to, to think very deeply on, about some of the, and it, it, even this question showed me how reflective she was and how deeply she was concerned or not like uh, involved and only invested in choosing the right cards. But straight away start seeing the difference in, in the team and her behavior and because she was so amazing, the team was so amazing, it was just easy. Um, and I think the biggest joy for me was when she also after um, one of our sessions, she, she sent this. Um, and there was no bigger reward for me, you know, how, how she could see that it was so much valuable for her. And all I did was just gave her the cards and said, do you want to play a game? <laughs> <laughs> and my philosophy is to think big but act small. In an amazing way, my understanding of Mel so far is that she thinks big and acts big as well. As far as I know, so far in the world, she's the, the, uh, the person to run the biggest customer experience deck and emotional culture deck hybrid project. 50% of a customer's experience is subconscious or how they feel. And so that's the premise that we based it all on, is how they feel. Welcome to Jeremy's Cards. Um, so that tied in really well. Um, so how I started was, um, I thought, right, I didn't know any better. And I think that's where what you were saying comes in. I just didn't know any better. And I'm super glad I didn't know any better, because I probably wouldn't have gone as large. But I was like, right. We're going to use the ECD and we're going to use the customer experience and it's a one day workshop because that's all I was allowed and who can I have in it? I want everybody, 900 staff all around New Zealand, that's what I want. So they did tone me back to just leadership. So we had about 300 people we were working with. Um, but we did go around the country and I did get to use both card decks and I did jam it all into one day. So I don't know how we did it but we did it. They're exhausted at the end of the day. Um, in terms of results, because that's always what businesses want to know too, and this is, you know, how do you measure customer experience or people experience? And we were really lucky that we have um, a way to measure customer reviews as a, as a really good way of defining how we've gone, and we could see measurable increase immediately as we were rolling out the workshops. Our customer reviews and ratings were going up and continue to go up. So. Yay, <laughs> that worked. I'm a bit backwards in the way this has come about because I didn't go to a workshop with Jeremy. Um, I just went for it. Um, but if I'd have known better, I probably wouldn't have done it all in one day. But I'm super glad I did because then it happened and it all rolled out. Have fun playing with the game and I'm looking forward to, to following along your journeys with the game. So thank you to our speakers and thank you Lottie for your help as usual, amazing. And uh, yeah, have a good evening and feel free to stick around a bit longer.